Welcome back. Um, we're going to be covering uh, topic one, lesson six today, which is learning literature and the arts in the Middle Ages. Uh, very often we tend to think of the Middle Ages as being a time when it was just bad. There was nothing good going on, that everything was just poverty and disease and sickness and war, and it was just absolutely horrible. And while some of those things did happen in some of the periods in the medieval period, uh, some of the times, uh, there were some remarkable achievements that these people made in these areas. So, so there was an intellectual component to the Middle Ages. And so that's what I'd like for us to look at with uh, Lesson 6. One of the things that started in medieval Europe was the concept of, of universities, uh, these guilds for learning, particularly to produce learned people that were needed in the church and the bureaucracies of, of the governments that were starting to get larger and they needed bureaucrats. Um, and it also gave opportunities for people that weren't nobles to rise up into prominence in society. So, so an education and an access to an education was actually a step upward uh, socially and economically. Um, there were several large universities that were established throughout the Middle Ages. Um, Salerno, Bologna in, uh, in, in Italy, Paris in France, and then Oxford and the later Cambridge in England are some of the earlier universities that were established. The course of study that was laid out was what we would today call the liberal arts. Um, you know, the idea is that you're going to get a little bit of everything. And uh, the degrees that were offered at universities were somewhat limited. Uh, you could either get a degree in law medicine or theology. So depending upon which direction you were heading, uh, whether it was a government job or a church job, um, you know, you, you would get this degree. Very often people didn't take degrees. They, they sat for a while at universities and that was enough to get them where they, they needed to go. So just simply attending would give you a leg up in society. The philosophy that governs the medieval period is called scholasticism. This is something that you find in Christian Europe and Muslim lands, as well as among Jewish scholars, this idea of, of reconciling their religious beliefs with the teachings and philosophies of Aristotle. So, so how can you take something that doesn't seem to agree with the greatest mind that they believe ever existed? How do you reconcile those two things? Because he's true, he's brilliant, and yet it doesn't agree with what you hold to be true with your faith. And so there's this whole effort to, to, to reconcile these two seemingly contradictory ideas. And like I said, there were also Muslim and Jewish contemporaries that were doing the same thing. The greatest Christian contemporary scholastic was Thomas Aquinas. He's actually a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. His uh, most famous work is called Summa Theologica. Um, it's something that, that is still authoritative in Roman Catholic theology today. So it introduces the idea, for example, of natural law, that God has set in motion certain things, and, and we have to obey those things, and that government exists for the common good. So you know, those are, are some things that we gained from this as a result of, of, of his ideas. Uh, largely, though, it's proofs for God and, and how to to reconcile Roman Catholic theology with a pagan Greek philosopher. There was little emphasis on the science and mathematics in universities. Um, you know, there just wasn't a whole lot that they really had to gain. If you wanted that, you had to go into Muslim lands for it. But, but the one exception that you have in this time period is the introduction of the Hindo-Arabic numeral system, which is what we use, uh, zero to nine. Okay. As far as literature is concerned, you see this is a time period where uh, vernacular languages, common spoken languages in a region start to get um, uh, recognition. They start to write these things down. More people are able to read and write. So you start to see these uh, examples of literature, things that were probably oral to start with, particularly some of the older ones, and, uh, and then they're, they're written down so that people could read them. So, you know, you have some examples here, the Song of Roland and the Poem of the Seed um, in French and in Spanish. Um, you know, epics uh, that talk about their national origins and, and a hero. 
The Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri uh, is really a social commentary on his own times, but he uses a, a, a imaginary trip through heaven, hell, and purgatory to do it. And then you have Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, where he is taking a series of, of, of pilgrims who are going to Canterbury to worship, and they're telling stories about their lives and humorous things as they travel. So you get little snapshots into how people looked at their own time period. Um, you also have Christine de Pizan's uh, The Book of the City of Ladies. I don't have this listed here, but um, you know a, a discussion by a woman from the medieval period about the roles of women and how, if given opportunities, women can still do a lot of things that men don't think they could do. Um, still something that's probably timely for today. Um, as far as art and architecture is concerned, uh, with architecture, you have two building styles that are dominant. We're going to look at some pictures of the difference between Romanesque and Gothic architecture. But Gothic architecture utilizes very thin walls that are, are, are able to, to have large stained glass windows because the roof of the building is supported by an outside structure called a flying buttress. So we're gonna look at some examples of that and show how Romanesque art, uh, architecture is, well, it's not ugly by any stretch of the imagination. It certainly is not as soaring as Gothic architecture was. Uh, we're gonna look at some examples of illuminated manuscripts. And we're also gonna look at a few examples from the Byzantine side of things with icons and how uh, the, the Byzantine world preserved Greek and Roman learning. Okay, so that's it for, uh, for lesson six. As always, if you have any questions, just um, email, me, email me or just let me know in class. Okay, thank you very much.